So I'll start right away by saying that the first thing we shall be looking at is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is a very, very wide spectrum. Very many signals actually conform to the electromagnetic field. And that's why I always say that the short man above one must have been an electrical engineer because everything in the world today is actually for mainly electromagnetic forces. Say force of friction, the mechanical friction that you have is all because of the electrostatic attraction between atoms of, on two surfaces and it becomes easy to look at it that way. Now, what we are going to do is to give a description of the electromagnetic spectrum. And what we shall be doing in that is to look at the frequency bands and how they are designated. Usually in the world, there, there is an international tele, telecommunication union which deals with the designation of the electromagnetic field lines for communication. And we also have other bodies which deal with standards in the, in the electromagnet, electrotechnical fields such as IEC or the International Electrotechnical Commission and the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electrical Engineers which is a collaboration or an association of electrical engineers and IEEE is a little bit different from IEK which is a Kenyan made one because they allow everybody with a background or who has an interest in electrical engineering to join. So we'll give a brief description of the frequency band allocations, how they are located, how they are, they are called and then we shall look at the Maxwell's equations after that. The Maxwell's equations will approach them in two forms. One, we shall look at the micro microscopic form or the macroscopic form, which includes the integrals. This you'll find that it's very familiar because the Faraday's law of induction and Ampere's circuit or law will come in here in form of the line integrals of the electric field and the line integral of the magnetic field intensities. Then we shall show using uh, vector theorems such as Stokes theorem and uh, the divergence theorem, we shall reduce those equations into the microscopic form. These are point functions, that is the, the electric and magnetic field intensities must conform or must satisfy these equations at a point in the in the region of space of interest. Two, we shall look at the reduced form of the Maxwell's equation, the reduced form in, in which case we shall try to look at the electric or uh, the electromagnetic wave with a preferred direction of propagation or an axis of propagation. And then we shall split the, the electric and magnetic field uh, intensities to be either parallel to the axis of propagation or to be in the transverse plane with the direction of propagation. And this will allow us to apply this or to apply the appropriate boundary conditions in given uh, spaces or in given regions of space of which we have an interest. This allows us to reduce the number of components of the fields that we have to deal with. Since the, electro, the electromagnetic field fills the whole space in 3D, we shall see that such reduced forms will allow us to drop either one or two components of the three component uh, magna, vector, vector fields. After that, we shall look at the Laplace's and Poisson's equations for electric field and the magnetic field intensities, which is E and H. This we shall see are the equation, the same equations you derived in electromagnetics or the electrostatics, where the Laplace's case is where we have homogeneous uh, wave equal, or the, the, the Laplacian is equal to zero, and the Parsons equation you can recall from your elect uh, physical electronics. We, did, uh, we used it a lot when we were looking at the electric field 
at interfaces, material interfaces, or where we have free charges or volume charge densities in the space. That will lead us now to what we call the Helmholtz equations. And the most important contribution of Maxwell is the introduction of the electric displacement, which allowed wave equations that are propagating in space. That is, they are undulating in, in time and also shifting their position in space. And this brings out the idea of the fields filling all space. If you looked at it without the displacement, then you would think that the electromagnetic field will fill all space instantaneously. But because of the time dependent or the finite time required for the field to propagate from the source to a given point in space, we shall see that we'll have retardation, uh, whatever concepts or retardation effects. Then we shall look at simple solutions of the Helmholtz equations or wave equations, and we shall look at this in different in different coordinate systems. One of them being the easiest, which is the rectangular coordinates, in which we have the basis uh, vectors x cap, y cap, and z cap. Then we shall look at the cylindrical coordinates, especially when you have round wires, like say, for example, those of us will be dealing with uh, electrical wiring in house buildings or communication wires and so forth. Most of them are usually round. And therefore you find that if we were to use the X cap, Y cap and Z cap in that kind of space, then we shall see that the basis vectors will also have a spatial derivative when we apply them to the at Maxwell's equations. And therefore, it's usually much more important to have a coordinate system that is polar in the transverse plane, and we have an axial direction, of which we shall conventionally assume the A axis or the cylinder will be, or the cylindrical space will be oriented along the Z axis of the Cartesian field, so that the Circular walls will be about in the transverse plane, which is x, y. Then we shall look at the spherical coordinates. The spherical coordinate system is usually important when we have point sources. Say, for example, a, a, a balloon of charge that is varying in time will send out waves into space. The best example is actually how the waves leave, or the heat, heat waves that leave the sun, or the light that leave, is leaving the sun, is coming to us. To analyze this, it's usually much more important to look at it in spherical coordinates because the source can be treated as a point source that is radiating or sending out waves in all directions. In, in space, and therefore it will look like a ball, so to speak, and the surface will arrive at the point of interest. So these spherical coordinate systems are going to be important. Cylindrical and coordinate systems are going to introduce new mathematical uh, concepts that you may not have met before, and this is usually a cause of uh, you know anxiety for many of us, but we shall so show that Many of these can be reduced to just simple total differential equations in a given direction. Then from there, we shall look at what we call the potential theory and the retarded potentials. Usually when you are dealing with electric electromagnetic fields, we are dealing with vector quantities. E is a three-dimensional uh, vector h is a three-dimensional vector as well. And when we put them in the Helmholtz equations, we shall have the fields, the components of these fields must satisfy Helmholtz equations in all directions, so to speak, okay? But when we look at it in terms of the potential theory, a potential is usually a scalar function. And therefore, all we need is only one equation, and then we can derive the fields in, in, with simple differentiation. I don't know about you, but my experience is that 
it's much more easier to do a differentiation and to do an integration. So when we are solving a field problem from the Maxwell's equations, all we are saying is that we are going to be integrating. And usually this would be a volume integral. And therefore it's much more difficult to fathom. But when we look at a potential, we'll just solve one problem, a volume integral of one volume, then we determine the potential. And then from the potential, we shall show how we can get the fields or derive the fields from that potential in terms of a simple spatial differentiation. The retarded potentials is such that what we said is that, say for example, how, how many minutes do we have to wait for, the, for a light wave generated at the sun to arrive at the surface of Earth? Can one of you tell me? Or tell us, so to speak? Whoever with a fast finger to the, to the unmute can unmute and answer. It takes two hours. The, the sun is about um, maybe 150,000, not even 150,000, it's ab about 150 mega kilometers away from us, so to speak. So 1.5 times 10 to the eight, I think, kilometers from here. And therefore, if you look at the speed of light, in vacuum, which is about 300 mega kilometers per mega meters per, per second, then it will take about 8.33 seconds or uh, minutes rather to arrive at Earth. And therefore, the sun can go out now, but we'll only know about this eight minutes later. Okay? This is what we call retardation. Many times, even when you are dealing with uh, digital circuits in, uh, in third year, you always say that you just switch on the system and you should get your output instantaneously. The same thing happens with the light bulb in, the, in your house. It takes the electric wave generated at the station, say Kindaruma or Maybe it has been switched on at a carrier switch state substation for it to come to Nairobi. It will take time. But usually the time that it takes is so, so little that you don't, we rarely notice it. But what we are saying is that when we start dealing with electromagnetic fields, we shall, we shall appreciate that it takes time. Even when you think before you can do anything, that thought must be taken to the, your, to the motor muscles from the brain and before your finger can move. Even the short man up there, when you were saying let there be light, it took him a few, a few seconds for the light to come on, isn't it? So, so we shall look at that. And this is just in the basis of reviewing. And Then we shall look at a few solutions of how to solve electrodynamic problems. And these are called numerical solutions. We may not get time to do this, but numerical solutions are very important, especially now that the world is going digital. And we shall, use, we shall show how we can use the computer to solve most of the problems that we have. Say, for example, we can use backward differences for differential equations or we can use those trapezoidal rules that you have met before for solving problems or solving integral problems. Now, in this particular course, we shall confine wave propagation in regions of space that don't have any boundaries. We shall assume that the boundaries are very far away and we shall be very far away from the source of those uh, waves themselves such that 
source effects and boundary effects can be ignored. And we shall just be looking at wave behavior at that on, uh, in that kind of region. So we shall first of all start with what we call perfect dielectric media. And perfect dielectric media, it means that they are linear. That is, if I change, if I double the electric field, the effect will be double. If I have it, the, the, the effect will be a half. Then the medium itself will be the same everywhere. We'll have the same properties. That is homogeneous. There's no place that will have a different characteristic than another. Then another one is what we call isotropic. That means regardless of which direction I face, the electromagnetic field will experience the same uh, effect or the same uh, impedances or effects from the medium itself. That is what we call a perfect medium. And one thing is that it does not lose or there'll be no attenuation of the wave. Once we launch it, it will continue in its, both in magnitude and speed in that particular medium. So such kind of media, we call them linear, homogeneous and isotropic media and both and lossless. And this will be described as a perfect or a simple medium. Then we shall go and now start, because that is boring, because practice shows that everything, there will always be losses. And therefore, we shall look at what losses can mean to the electromagnetic field uh, wave propagation in the medium. And therefore, we shall look at what we call the lossy the electric media. And therefore, if you see the way we have written it, they will be of inf infinite extent. That is, the boundaries are very, very far, and the sources are very, very far from where the observer is situated, the one who is experiencing the electromagnetic wave in that area. Such kind of media will be called unbounded or boundless media. Now, then we shall see that in reality, we'll always have some kind of boundaries where a medium changes from one to another. Say, for example, if I have a, a region that is filled with air, and then another part of the region, I fill it now with copper, so, so to speak. That is, the observer can move. So we can move very far away from the boundary and deal with and analyze our field in that, for, in that region. Then we can walk closer and closer to the boundary with another medium. How will the wave that we see, how will it behave when it approaches the, the boundaries? This is an important kind of thing because many of us have been using mirrors and those mirrors that we use to put on our makeup or to shave our beards, they are all media and we are using wave reflection or an electromagnetic wave reflection to see our images in those kind of materials. So we are going to understand this in an electrical way rather than the way we, we followed it with optics where you are just following rays. Now we shall solve the fields that must be excited in the surface of the silver coating in a mirror, a glass mirror, so to speak. Here, the electromagnetic field, of course, is the in form of light, the, what we call light all the time. Yeah, you can always, we shall show that when we get closer and closer to the source, many of the waves will start to uh, take on uh, some kind of, you know, uh, differences. What we are saying is that if we were, to, we were riding with a wave, we shall see that the, if the wave was a cosine and we are moving with a cosine, we shall not see that change of the cosine, but our face will be changing from one, from uh, uh, over time or over the space. And if the face is constant, and, it, and the fields are always in a planar kind of direction, then we call those plane 
waves. If their amplitude is not changing, then it will be called uniform plane waves. So constant plane wave, constant phase we uh, whatever planes will be moving at constant speed along the field. So this uniform plane waves is how we are going to explain or to describe our wave itself. If the wave was a spherical wave, then it would have constant face surfaces that are spherical. If it's cylindrical, it will have cylindrical constant face whatever surfaces which we shall call wave fronts then we shall look at two things we know that the speed of light is supposed to be constant and it's given by c which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second approximately in vacuum if we the wave was to be forced to go through some kind of glass there will be a change of phase. But that is only if we are looking at the perfect medium, that the medium is not lossy and it's linear and homogeneous. If the medium is a bit complex, what we shall see is that the wave will no longer be moving or the constant phase points will not be moving at constant speed anymore. If we have a, an electromagnetic field that has many frequency components, we shall see that not all components will be traveling at the same phase velocity. And therefore, we shall see that the whole group of frequencies that we have will be moving at a group, you know, at a given average velocity, which we shall call the group velocity. The way I like, the way I like looking at it, the way I like looking at it is by looking at you know, a group of marathoners, say for example, the standard marathon, like the Nairobi standard marathon, where you have, say for example, a group of people, maybe a million, chasing a million at the end of the of this race. We all start at the same, at the start line at the same time, but some of us in the group will be traveling fast. So they finish the race in two hours. Some of us will be finishing in the afternoon or the later in the evening. So we can say that we, each of us is moving at its own phase velocity, but the group itself, if we were to take the average, will divide you know, the time, the finish, to the, the start, to the finish of everyone. And if we were to divide that one by the time, we shall see that the, the distance is the same, but now the time for the whole group is bigger, and therefore the velocity of the group will be smaller. So that's how we will be looking at that phase and group velocities. I don't know whether I've lost you. Now, there is something that is very important to us, and this is something we call polarization. Polarization, we'll approach it in two ways. There are two types of polarization, but they all deal with directions of the magnetic field. One, there is material polarization. That is, if we were to apply an electric field to a, to a molecule, we are going to have uh, the negative electron charge going away or going away from the positive side or trying to climb up the direction of the, magnet, of the electric field. And there will be a displacement of the charge centers of negative charge and the positive nuclear charge. And therefore, the, while the atom can be, or the molecule can be in a neutral, can be seen as a spherical distribution of charge, when you bring, put it in an electric field, what will happen is that the, it will change shape towards a more of a rugby ball, so to speak, kind of uh, shape. This is called material polarization. It will be important to us when we deal with the, the properties of the dielectric media that the waves will be finding themselves in. How do they do? If the medium is easily polarized, it will change the, uh, the characteristics of the waves propagating through it. Now, the polarization that we are talking about here 
will be the polarization or the direction of the electric field as the wave is propagating through space. This is by convention. We could use a magnetic field intensity vector, but many of the convention is that we use the electric field, uh, field intensity vector and how it's pointing in a given position in space. That is, we shall be at a given z and then we'll be looking at our wave approaching us or going away from us and we look at the, the tip or the vector of the electric field intensity. How is it changing at our position with time? We shall see the most general case is where that field or the field vector will be rotating and the tip will be describing an elliptic kind of surface. This we call elliptical polarization. Now, if and it must have two components, that is either a Y and a Z component of different amplitudes, and they are displaced in time phase, so to speak. If the two amplitudes are equal, then we shall see like a you know, like a circle, it will, the tip of the vector will be describing a circle. But if we have only one component, either X or Y, then the vector will be pointing either in one direction, so to speak, either diagonally or vertically in the Y direction and so forth. And this we shall call linear polarization. So the best way to look at it is when you are using an oscilloscope and you put you know, you put the two axes or the two inputs, that is the Y and the X inputs, you put them into, you know, X, Y mode. We have two channels. One, you excite it with a sine wave, and the other, you excite it with a, with a cosine wave, which is a sine wave of 90 degrees shift. And what you'll see is that if the two voltages are of different, uh, different amplitudes, you'll see an ellipse being formed. If they are equal, you'll see them pointing like a diagonal kind of thing. And if they are, you input the whatever to form the circle, circle thing. If they are equal and the same face, you get a line. If they are of 90 degrees face shape, you see a circle or an ellipse. So this is how you learn, will understand this polarization and the polarization ellipse that we shall be dealing with to describe the magnetic waves. Then we shall look at how propagation, the wave propagation, how does it behave in an isotropic media? We say that we have isotropic media where the medium properties are the same everywhere in every direction. And therefore, the fields will behave the same way. And now we are talking about a medium in which the properties depend on the direction in which we are looking at it. Some of these materials that are of interest to us with things like the, the DNA. The DNA molecule is termed to be chiral because it, it has either left hand or right hand. For those of us who did a course in organic chemistry, you remember we had molecules that had, you know, we used to call them stereo molecules, and some of them used to have a left hand molecule or right hand molecule, and most one of them usually used to be a poison, or the other one was a beneficial thing, so to speak. So the properties are not the same depending on the direction or the right handedness or left handedness of the particular molecule. So we shall look at how the electromagnetic field of wave will propagate in such media. This is a, just an introduction because it's going to be a little bit heavy mathematically. And therefore, most times we just introduce by just mentioning it for completeness. Then we have, we are, we have all had several courses in transmission lines, so we know that when I have a transmission line of characteristic impedance at dot and another one of a characteristic impedance at one, and I connect the two, there will be reflection at where the connection of the two transmission lines are 
For if I terminated a transmission line of characteristic impedance Z0 with an impedance ZL, then always be reflection axis from the load when I connect, when I send in a, a, a wave. And it will only, the reflections are going to be zero only if ZL is equal to Z0, which you call a matched line. Now we shall show that even our media, the boundaries of two media, which are boundless, so that we have one half plane is filled with one medium and the other half plane is filled with another one, and we are looking at the boundary at Z equal to zero. We can also use the transmission line model that you are, you are familiar with to analyze that problem. That is, we shall model our media uh, boundary in terms of the transmission line. And we shall see that the equations that you derived for the transmission line are the same equations that we derive for the fields or the, for the unbounded media. The only thing that will change is that now for the characteristic impedance of the line, we shall have what we call the intrinsic impedance of the medium itself. Say for example, vacuum has a characteristic impedance or an intrinsic impedance of about 377 ohms, so to speak, okay? So this is what we have said, is that we shall look at uh, what we call the wave impedance or the intrinsic wave impedance concept. And then we shall look at what we call diffraction. We have seen, we'll see that when we look at reflection, we can have specular reflection where the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of refraction or, or, or the, or, uh, the angle of incidence is the same as the angle of reflection. Now, in some cases, even for sound, you find that the wave, instead of following that simple rule, we see a bending, that is you are out of the line of sight of the source and but you can still see the source because the, la the light wave went around the bend. Such kind of propagation cannot be explained in terms of reflection. And therefore, we shall look, we say that the wave has been diffracted. And therefore we shall look at two forms of diffraction theories. One, Fresnel's diffraction, which is, which is valid very close to the source, okay? When the object is very close to the source, and Fraunhofer diffraction, which occurs very far away from the source. So it's just a matter of the distances, the relative distances between the source and the object, which is causing the diffraction. That is the difference of the two of them. Yeah. So once we look at that, we shall have two theories. One is called the geometric theory of diffraction. This is using rays. Scattering is just when you have, uh, you shine, say, light on a surface, and then the light is uh, reflected in all different directions, okay? We say that the light has been scattered, and such kind of reflection is, not, is called uh, non-specular. A mirror is a specular reflection uh, device, but when you look at the walls, if you want to reduce the glare that you see, otherwise you will be seeing your, you know, your images everywhere. You want the walls to be diffused, that is to diffuse the light all over, such that there's no particular direction the light is reflected. So it fills the whole room. This is an important thing, especially for those of us who go into the lighting industry, how to reduce glare in living spaces or in office spaces and so forth. Then we shall look at what we call the gaseous insulating materials. That is how can we stop electricity or electrical power from leaking out from the areas that we have or how can we separate two surfaces or two conducting surfaces, you know, removing short surfaces and the like. And therefore, for us to understand this, we need to know how does electromagnetic field interact with matter. 
So this is what we were talking about, the, the electric properties of materials. So we shall then look at, once we have understood how they interact, we shall look at how the gaseous insulators, such as air or sulfur hexafluoride, which you'll be meeting, especially when you are dealing with power systems and transformers, how do they break down? Can I just apply as high a voltage as I want between the electrodes of the transformer? Can I, you know, supply power at any given voltage? What do I have to, uh, to think about? If you look at the transmission lines that you see, the Kenya power transmission lines that you see are in the villages, some of them are on very high poles, others are much closer to the, uh, to the surface. And this is just something to deal with the voltages in the wire and the distance to the ground, which is usually like a short, so to speak. So we want to see how, do, how does air break down and cause that kind of flash. Even lightning at, uh, on, a, on a rainy day, how does it break down the air? So those are the mechanisms that we shall be looking at. Now, among them, we shall look at what we call cathode processes. And these cathode processes is where if you have a vac or a vacuum tube filled with a gas and we apply an electric voltage or an electrostatic voltage between the two electrodes, the anode and the cathode, and we keep on raising this, the air may break down and if the electrons will go towards the anode and the positive class ions will move towards the cathode. But because of the electric field in between the electrodes, the ions and the electrons are accelerated. So when these positive ions hit the cathode, they may have a sufficient energy to dislodge electrons out of the cathode material and therefore increase the number of electrons between the electrodes which will cause further you know will cause further ionization of the neutral gas ion uh, gas molecules so to speak so this is what we are calling cathode processes and this will therefore introduce something we call the second thousand coefficient of ionization there is a first thousand co coefficient of ionization which does not involve the cathode processes. It only involves just the, the initial ionization of the gas molecules with the electrons that we do have within the, the gas tube. Then we shall look at what we call patient's law. It's a way of introducing or a, a connection between the breakdown current and the breakdown voltage. How are they related? Passion's law is very important, especially when you are dealing with gas discharge dis tubes, such as the fluorescent lamp and the neon lamps for signage and the like. Then we shall look at streamer mechanism of spark formation in gases. This is an explanation of how even lightning starts and how does the, the lightning progress, so to speak. But this we shall be looking at gases and gas insulators, so to speak. Then there's what we call corona discharge. Anybody who has ever walked under uh, a 132 kV line, I'm sure you must have had some kind of boiling, you know, a boiling sound or a hissing sound. This is because the air surrounding the wire is breaking down, but the breakdown is not so strong such that we can have a flush to ground. So it's just the discharge around, you know, around the wire itself. And therefore you, feel, you hear that boiling, you know, kind of uh, 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 sound surrounding that wire. I don't know whether any one of you has ever experienced that. You won't hear corona discharge on the distribution lines. You can only hear it when you're under, say, for example, the 132 or the 220 KV lines. That's when you'll hear them, or you'll hear that kind of hissing sound. So, after we deal with that corona discharge, then we shall be through. We shall be through with our lesson, or our course, and then we shall have to face what we call the 
at the examination level, so to speak. Now, electromagnetic field has been around, or the theory has been around for many, many years. Maxwell did his work in the 18th century, and therefore you can be sure that there are lots and lots of books that have been written on electrical uh, electromagnetic fields. It's a very old kind of topic. Each one of the authors has a bias towards the direction of what his specialization has been. There are books written by physicists, books written by electrical engineers, and all of them may approach the electromagnetic uh, problem in different ways. And therefore, what I'm proposing here is that I'll be using, I'm basing most of my topic or the treatment of this course will be based on the book by David Chen. And it's called Field and Wave Electromagnetics. It, the book I own is a second edition of 1989, and it's published by the Pearson Education Singapore. And it was printed in New Delhi. That would be the class book that I'll be basing most of my topics on. Two, uh, consultation will, can be done with the book by Ramo S. and Wina Rijayar and Fanduza. It's called Fields and Waves in, Electro in Communication Electronics. This is a little bit heavier than the David Chang one, but if you have that, you can always use it as well. It should be easy, easy to follow. This is by John Wiley and Sons, and the, the edition I have, which is the third edition, was printed in Asia, PTE of Singapore. Another book, classical book that you may find useful is called Crow is Electromagnetics, the second edition by Krauss, JD, and Carver. This was published by the McGraw-Hill of Kogashuka Limited Talk Show, and it was published in 1973. Krauss was uh, mainly from the physics background, and uh, then he started engineering, of course, but what, uh, what happens is that some of his formulation may be a little bit uh, uh, confusing if we, if we just follow the David Chen one. But the only difference is that Krauss uses weird kind of uh, symbols, those Greek symbols, and uh, everyone has learned to hit because of difficulties in uh, reproducing them by hand. And therefore, most of the time, that would be a good book to have. You know, for you to have in the shelves, you can always read it from time to time. It has good treatment as well, only that you must be careful. It's a little bit uh, more difficult than the chain in the chain one. Now, like I said, electrodynamics is a topic that is studied using vectors, and therefore. A lot of we are going to be meeting a lot of vector calculus divergence the curl of uh, vector fields and so forth these are going to come to us and while we studied them in, uh, in mathematics in third year this is when we are going to be applying them and if you are not familiar with that kind of vector calculus i would suggest that you appraise yourself or refresh your mind or your whatever you are mind with it so that because we shall be applying vector calculus a lot in this particular course therefore it's um, it's good to have this book by crazy erwin which is a mathematics book called the advanced engineering mathematics uh, the one i have is eighth edition of 1999 and it was published by wiley india of New Delhi. You can get any other book that you feel that is uh, useful to you, especially if it's dealing with vector calculus. It's uh, important to have that vector calculus in mind. Another one that would be nice would be by Andrew L. C. and Phillips R.L. called Mathematical Techniques for Engineers and Scientists, a book of 2006 
by Prentice Hall of India in Delhi. You can get better editions at least from New York and I will be a little bit more pricey than this. So what I'm saying is you should have at least a mathematics book which has this vector calculus. And two, I'm going to remind you that regardless of which book you take, the first thing you have to do before you start reading the material, please look at the preface to that book, read it, and understand what the approach is. We will find that what we shall be basing our system on is on the SI unit, where it's, which is a rationalized kind of uh, system of units in which the Maxwell's equations will not have the pi, the pi symbol will not appear in the quantities that we'll be dealing with them because the system has been rationalized by the definition of the magnetic permeability of free space, we now use 4 pi times 10 raised to minus 7 Henry per meter. While the physics guys, if you read a book written by physics guys, apart from the Krauss and cover, you'll find that they may not be using the rationalized SI system, and therefore that we shall get 4 pi appearing in the Maxwell's equations. So the idea is always to make sure that you know what kind of system that a particular order is following. Otherwise, but there is no difference into it. Once you take care of those rationalization concepts, then every equation that we derive will be the same. So it's important to have that kind of thing. Now with that, I'll give you the field. Please try to, let's see whether we have followed. If you have any questions, you can ask now. Any questions? Did I lose everyone? Even to say that you are happy with it so that you can continue will be good enough. At least I want to hear some sound from your end. Am I all alone? No, you're not alone. We're happy with it. Yeah, yeah okay. so I can give you a five minute break, then we can look at the first the first topic of the day. Because I think we are uh, we still we are right in time. We can always go to the new one as well. So I'll give you a five minute break to try and stretch, then I'll look at the first topic, which is the electromagnetic spectrum. And I'll share it now.
So, okay, we can now continue. So what I'll be talking about, I hope you can see the new material, it's now electromagnetic spectrum. So, electromagnetic spectrum, we have said it covers all frequency ranges from zero hertz, that is DC, to frequencies that we cannot even start talking about. Okay, the numbers will be very, very high, so to speak. But it's, it covers all, everything. But one thing I always, uh, we have to understand is that in my, in digital electronics, you talk of things called cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are not part of the electronic, electromagnetic spectrum because cosmic rays are not fields, electromagnetic fields. They are just very energetic particles. If you recall the physical electronics, we say that an electron can be considered a wave or a particle, depending on how you look at it. Its behavior is different. If you have very energetic particles, they also behave like waves. And that's why we usually have what we call cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are usually alpha particles or helium, helium ions and beta particles or electrons which have been accelerated to very, very high speeds by, by the process in which they are formed, such as the explosion of stars and galaxies and so forth. Another thing we know is gamma rays are actually electromagnetic rays, as well as the X-rays. And these are very energetic waves. And these ones, instead of talking about their frequencies, we shall be talking about their quantum energy or photon energy, so to speak. So the electromagnetic spectrum will consist of all forms of electromagnetic radiation. Okay. And this will be arranged in order of frequency or wavelength and into a number of ranges. And these ranges are dictated by how the, the characteristics of the electromagnetic waves themselves. Do they have common characteristics? How similar are they? That's, that is how they interact with media or with the dialectic media or the media that is through which they are propagating. We'll decide how we can group them together into groups. They can, the frequency ranges that we have grouped them into will therefore call them bands. So you'll hear of frequency band this, frequency medium frequency band, or high low frequency band, long waves, and so forth. So when we have several bands that are connected together, that are adjacent to each other, we call that now the spectra. Okay? So the, the a contiguous array of bands will form what we call a spectrum. So the subbands are defined within the bands and will be generally be referred to as segments in the communication industry. So specification of the spectrum, how do we specify it? This can always be in terms of one, the usual form is to look at the wavelength. Since we are saying that the, the wave is propagating through space, we can look at the the distance between two adjacent adjacent peaks on the wave, okay, or two constant phase fronts or wave fronts, constant phase wave fronts, how close they are, and that will be called the wavelength of the wave itself. Remember, wavelength and period, time period are not the same. In the laboratory, I've had people dealing with the oscilloscopes and they talk of wavelength of the, of the wave they are measuring on the oscilloscope screen, but that is only a period, a time period you're looking at. This wavelength is something to do with space. They say that the wave themselves will be either sinusoidal or also in space as well as in time. So the wavelengths we shall be dealing with will start from very small wavelengths in atometers, that is 10 to the minus 18. This would be in the region of the gamma rays or the 
electromagnetic forces within a nucleus of an atom and so forth. We go to femtometers or FM, which is 10 to the minus 15 meters. We go to picometers, which is 10 to the minus 12. Continue to nanometers, which is 10 to the minus 9 of a meter, a micron or micrometer, which is 10 to the minus 6, and all the way to kilometers. And we shall see that as we go closer and closer to the centimeter and meter wavelengths, it, might, it makes more sense to define the, the electromagnetic wave in terms of its frequency. So for very high frequencies, we use the wavelength. For very low frequencies, we use the frequency itself. It's a number that you can put in the head, so to speak. We shall see that even in atometers, instead of describing a wavelength of the, of the wave, we shall use the quantum or the photon energy of the wave. We can talk about cycles per second. This is what we call the frequency. And we know the basic frequency or the basic unit is the Hertz, which is the DC, or we start from the tens, from DC to a few tens of Hertz. Then we have the kilohertz, when we have thousand Hertz or thousand cycles per second. We can go to megahertz or MHz which is the, the whatever the 10 to the 6, a million cycles per second. And look at the formulation. We can see that megahertz is written with a capital M. If I use the a small m, I'll be talking about millihertz, and it will be a thousandth of a millisecond, or of a cycle per second, so to speak. Then we go to gigahertz, and the present day we have what we call the terahertz, which starts from 10 to the 12. The terahertz is a very important frequency range now in the, in the electromagnetic world because most of the devices that are coming now that are new, the applications are now in this particular level of frequencies, so to speak. Now, if the frequency is very high, therefore its wavelength is very, very small, it's sometimes easier to define the electromagnetic wave in terms of electron of the photon energy HF and measured in electron volts. That is, we'll have HF divided by Q. H, remember, from physical electronics is the usual Planck's constant. This is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules second. Okay, the frequency will be in hertz, and therefore what we get is one electron volt is equivalent to 241 terahertz. That is a wave with a one electron volt photon energy is, has an equivalent frequency of 241 terahertz. So the electromagnetic spectrum may be roughly divided into three regions for convenience of study. And remember, the, the grouping is in terms of the properties of that particular electromagnetic wave. So the first one is what we call the optical spectrum. And this starts from light. You know, it's where we talk about light. Light is just a region of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is visible to the animal, uh, whatever eye. That is, we have evolved to see that. We can also have what we call the DC to light spectrum. That is all the spectra that does not in, include the visible light itself. That is, we'll turn from DC to something we call the infrared or something like that. Then we have what we have a call light to gamma. Remember, light refers to the visible spectrum. Okay, the visible range of the spe electromagnetic spectrum. And the gamma ray is light that is very, very high frequency beyond the X-ray. But fortunately, it's usually ionizing. And therefore, it's a good thing we have the ozone and our atmosphere such that gamma rays that we can experience on Earth are only those ones which we make ourselves. Okay? Any other rays, gamma rays produced in the, in the cosmos do not get to the bottom, uh, to the surface of the earth because they'll be dissipated by ionizing the air 
that surrounds us, the atmospheric gases that we have that surround us, we are protected from the gamma ray. This would appear, gamma rays will come mainly from nuclear explosions, especially the hydrogen bombs and the like. The boundary between some of the spectral regions is actually arbitrary. We just choose where to put the boundary, okay? And most of the times you'll find that some of those regions do not have sharp edges and may overlap in some cases, especially when we are dealing with what we call microwave and what we call the short wave. It's usually a bit diffuse to know where that where the boundary is. So the spectrum, the optical spectrum is defined as the visible range of the electromagnetic field to the near visible regions of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. That is, in the lower end, we'll be going to infrared, near infrared, and above, we shall be talking about ultraviolet. We know that in the colors of the rainbow, the violet is the high, highest uh, color that you have on the rainbow. That is the highest frequency and the red is the lowest frequency. Just below the red that you can see, and just above the violet you can see, that is where those will form the boundaries of the visible re region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is what we call light. So every time if you are told about light, if someone talks about light, all they're talking about is a frequency within the visible range of the, of the EM spectrum. So, the infrared range starts from 700 nanometer in wavelength to about a millimeter. Or we start from 429 terahertz in frequency down to 300 gigahertz. Okay. The visible range itself starts from 400 nanometers in wavelength to about 700 nanometers, where the 700 is almost the near edge of the red. Or in terms of frequencies, we are talking about 750 terahertz and down to 429 terahertz. And you can see the kind of numbers we are dealing with. So for the visible range, instead of talking about frequency, it's much better to deal with a wavelength, so it's a much easier number to work around. And this is why we are saying that we can specify them in terms of all those three, that is quantum energy, the or photon energy wavelength or cycles per second. The ultraviolet ranges from about less than 300, uh, just above 300, uh, three nanometer in wavelength, up to 400 nanometer, or in other words, we start with 300 electron volts. That's a very, very big energy in terms of photon energy, down to 100, uh, 250 or 3.106 electron volts. This will be the range where we'll have X-rays and gamma rays and all sorts of things. The DC to light spectrum is the spectrum that, or the spectrum band that lies below the infrared spectrum. And this is subdivided into one, the microwave range, starting from about 300 megahertz, which is the bottom edge of the short wave, to about 300 gigahertz, where we saw that is the beginning of the optical range. These are the regions where we shall be dealing with, uh, I'm sure all of us have heard and are excited about the 5, 5G network. The 5G network will be working mainly in the microwave range, and we shall see that some of the microwave ranges will be called millimeter waves or centimeter waves, so to speak. So in some cases, you may find that the microwave range would be taken as starting from one gigahertz. That is, the radio frequency will be assumed to have moved from 300 gigahertz to about one gigahertz, so to speak. So, 
radio frequency or RF range is all those electromagnetic waves with a frequency of about 10 kilohertz to about 300 megahertz. The 10 kilohertz, it, for those of us who remember, that would be what you call the medium waves in radio communication. I'm sure for us, most of us are just familiar with FM. FM has a voltage, it's about the frequency range for FM stations is about 88 to about 108 megahertz. Short wave starts from about one megahertz to about 30 megahertz. Then we have the medium ranges, which is from those 10 kilohertz to about 15 or 50 there to a megahertz or so. And we have long, long waves, which are very important, especially very popular in Europe and ship, ship, ship to ship communication. Then we have what we call the power or the tele and telephone range. Now this involves the DC, that is DC power that you get from say batteries or rectifiers, AC rectifiers, and up to 10 kilohertz. That will be treated as the power and telephone range. Telephone will be about, the telephone wire usually uses about uh, from about uh, 300 hertz to about 3 kilohertz for the FM, of course, that one we have already talked about, that is the voice range will be that. But today we are dealing with what you call the wireless telephones, and therefore the wireless telephones are not what are included in this telephone range. The telephone range here is envisaging those days when we had wire landlines and the likes. The gamma ray spectrum or the light to gamma ray spectrum. Now this is on the upper end of the visible range that is beyond the UV spectrum. It will be divided into one, it will be divided into X-rays and this now we are using the photon energy to describe starting from about 300 electron volts to about 30 kilo electron volts, very high frequency, so to speak. True, we have the gamma rays, which have energies beyond 30 kilo electron volts. Gamma rays in the universe are generated by supernovae, that is when stars explode or galaxies explode or galaxies collide like the one we had, or those who are we call black holes colliding like the excitement we had, I think two years ago, 2018, I think, when some of the effects were recorded on Earth. Now, like I said before, and I have, have I highlighted here in red, is that cosmic rays, which you studied when you are dealing with solid state semiconductor memory devices, they are very detrimental to it because they make the devices lose memory, are just energetic particles. And therefore, they are not electromagnetic radiation, but particles behaving like, like waves. And like I said, from the physics who the physicists who studied, they call them alpha particles. The alpha particles are simply helium uh, helium ions, that is He with a single electron removed, and they are called the alpha particles. And they would call the beta particles being the negatively charged particles, which are just electrons, so to speak. So, most electronic systems will emit in the RF and microwave ranges. That is, your telephone is radiating. All the time is radiating some kind of energy. Most of this energy range will be in the RF or microwave range. That is the frequency they can reproduce. When you have rotary machinery, especially those ones which have commutators, say for like a DC motor with a brush, those carbon brushes, as they form the arc, as these you make and, uh, and make the, the contact, 
the, the energy that will be radiated or will be emitted from such kind of occurrences will usually be in the power and telephone range. That is from about DC to what we say about 10 kilohertz. Okay, and that's why most of the time you can hear the arcs as they form and uh, release. Batteries and AC power rectifiers are the reason, are the ways we generate DC. Of course, what we can, someone, a sharp person can say is that we also have what we have nowadays, which we call the PV, light, uh, PV panels or the photovoltaic panels, which are just silicon diodes exposed to light and therefore generating electricity by photo absorption of sun rays. So those will produce power in DC or DC power rather than electric power or AC power, so to speak. Now the frequency bands can be combined with, we can combine microwave and RF as well as telephone spectra and then divide them into now words that we've, we may have met before, especially if we are reading a communications book, you'll hear people talk of extremely low frequency band or the ELF band, especially in shipping, navigation and the likes. This, all we are saying is that we are dealing with uh, electromagnetic waves that are of frequencies between 30 and 300 hertz. Then we have what we call the voice frequency or VF band. That is from 300 hertz to about three kilohertz. We know that the human being is able to hear sounds from about 10, kilo, 10 hertz to about 20, 20 kilohertz. That is if you are still young and, and uh, an adult, adulterated by the sounds or you know, what that you get from matatus, especially those rongai matatus, in which play music at very high volumes, and your ears are therefore hardened. You can hear from about 10 to 20 kilohertz. So, but the voice frequency we are dealing with is because you only need a very small frequency band for you to understand what I'm saying, okay? I don't have to produce 10, 10 hertz for you to hear me. If I produce, if you can get, your ear is such that it starts from about 300 hertz to about three kilohertz, you are able to understand what that person is saying. Now, if you increase that bandwidth, the only thing you are doing is now that you can now tell a little bit more detail. Now you can get even sound quality and therefore you can tell different people from speaking at the same time. But as far as communication is concerned, we can always transmit every information that you are saying within that band, 300 to three kilohertz. This was used so that we can have, you know, we can improve the efficiency of the propagation of the sound over the wire. Now, very low frequency or VLF band. This is from about three kilohertz to about 30 kilohertz. This again is communication, especially for navigation with ships and the likes. We have LF or low frequency band. Again, we see that kind of thing and so forth. At the higher end, we have what we call ultra high frequency UHF, you must have heard about it. Very high frequency or VHF, which is very important in uh, plane or whatever the air, airlines and air, uh, air navigation. And super high frequency or SHF, which is three gigahertz to 30 gigahertz and we have extremely high frequency E or ELF band. Now, the new, the new kid on the block is what we are calling 5G new radio or 5G NR devices that will be coming or that are coming online. Now, given that Safaricom is testing a 5G device or communication at about 2.6 gigahertz, where do you think that frequency lies? in these frequency bands we have contacted, we, can, we have indicated here. What would you call it? Anyone? In which band does the 2.6 gigahertz 5G new radio network from Safaricom in Kenya, in which band is it situated? 
ultra high yes it's in the ultra high frequency band remember long ago we used to have ultra high frequency band occupied by by tv and the reason why we migrated from the analog tv to digital tv was because we wanted to release some of the frequency bands that the tv channels were occupying for other uses and one of the uses is the 5g network yes the 5g network is appearing in two frequency ranges is the fr1 which is that sub six gigahertz frequency range although now it's called sub six but it has been the higher frequency has been changed to 7.125 gigahertz so the fr2 or the frequency range 2 is starting from about 24.25 uh, gigahertz to 56 or uh, 52.6 gigahertz and that will place it in what Where does that fall into? Anyone? Extremely high frequency. Well, it will uh, it will uh, traverse both the super high frequency. It's starting from 24.25 gigahertz and then it will go into the the super extremely high frequency which is because of the 52.6 gigahertz so that's what we are saying that we can span over the bands and of course there has been proposed now there's six gigahertz which will be starting from about 90 94 gigahertz and so forth the anti-collision radar or the vehicular communication will be in around 77 to about 94 gigahertz as well so it will be in extremely high frequency ranges the reason why we are going higher and higher in frequency is that when you deal with the telecommunication and modulation we find that the bandwidth that you can use increases the with the frequency of the carrier wave that we have so when we take the upper you ultra high frequency and super high frequency and a part of the the lower part of the uh, extremely high frequency bands we can divide this now into the ranges for the guys who deal with radar systems we now start having new names for them and those have been just subdivided in what we call the l band s band and c band <coughs> We also have what we call X band. X band was the first one to be used around in during the Second World War. That's when the radar was uh, was developed. And since you didn't want to tell the enemy on which band you are dealing with, they were they called it the X band. Okay. So the X band has now been formalized to be the frequency range from eight gigahertz to twelve gigahertz. Today, if you look at all if you were to look outside your window you'll see communication dishes or the microwave links those will be operating in the x band mostly they are used for wireless line of sight kind of relay to reduce the number of wires you have to draw out so to speak then you go to q band and so forth the k band q band and all the way to w band but and this all of these have different ways in which they propagate we shall see that as the frequency increases rather than using wire it will be more important to use we use uh, this you know broadcast it into over the air and sometimes we need to guide it by using hollow pipes instead of solid pipes because of what you may have met in uh, your studies Called the skin effect. You'll find that we don't need the whole wire anyway anymore. We can always use a whole wire, so to speak. So these bands are not really very important to keep in mind. The only thing we shall be dealing with in this particular course is just the frequency itself. 
And most of the time, we are, we shall not even tell you what the frequency is. The frequency will be given there just so that we can get the a rough idea of the quantities we are dealing with. But most of the time, we shall just be looking at an electromagnetic wave of any given frequency and propagating in the boundless media for this particular part of the electrodynamic system. This other kind of uh, knowing the frequency will come in when we start talking about the interactions with, my, uh, with the, the, my dielectric media and the interfaces. Because diffraction will start to occur when the object is of the same size or comparable size with the wavelength of the wave that you are shining it with or you are illuminating it with. If this object is much larger than the size or the, or the wavelength, then we'll have simple reflection. If when these come closer together, we have diffraction around the lens. Now, in, in terms of uh, allocating usage, uses of the spectrum itself, the use applications are, have been designated or have been delegated to the ITU or the International Telephone Telecommunication Union. And this has designated certain bands and reserved them for certain uses. These are called the industrial, scientific, and medical applications, or what you just call them the ISM bands. ISM bands are not licensed. Anyone can use them. But, but if you use it, you have to be to put up with the interference that you would get from the uses from industrial, scientific, and medical applications. For example, around 13 megahertz, that is in a, an ISM band that is used in the industry, especially the, the, the semiconductor industry, of which for us is very, you know, it's of interest. It's, it's used for induction heating. When you are purifying, say, for example, semiconductors after, you know, you start from silicon dioxide, you reduce it to silicon, and then you want to refine that silicon and to make the crystal to become as one crystal as possible rather than a uh, polycrystal and silicon, you want a monocrystal, okay, one crystal. So you will heat it in what you call the Skrolarsky kind of uh, process. So you heat it with coils. That's what we call induction heating. Today, the induction heater is also coming into the house, okay, in terms of the induction, uh, uh, magnetic induction heater and the likes. Another band that is important is actually that of the 2.4 gigahertz, where at 2.45, we have the microwave oven that we have in the kitchens nowadays for heating. And also, there's one guy who decided that he wanted to use that, and that's what we call the Bluetooth. Bluetooth uh, uh, devices work around at a center frequency of about 2.5 gigahertz, which is well within the ISM band. Okay, so this remember the ISM bands are reserved for industrial, scientific, and medical applications, and you don't need to be licensed by anyone. And all you need to do is to keep your power down so that you don't spew it out too far. Okay, so you don't have to go to CAK to seek for a license for a license to use that band when you start. Um, making your devices say for example in the lab for practice and the lights okay anybody using that band such as bluetooth he must uh, arrange such that his any interference that you might might cause them they cannot take you to court okay they are infringing and that's why when you go to hospitals and banks and the likes they ask you to either switch off your your device or something like that so that you don't interfere with their um, system so to speak so like we said they are in license bands and they are located for low power devices for <clears throat> and the radio communication services that operate in these bands must therefore accept harmful interference from the ism applications 
say you have pacemakers, you have those thermograms and the likes, as long as you are using in the ISM band, anybody with a communication device that is operating in that frequency band must tolerate that interference, must accept it. So, like I said, semiconductor industries are using the 13 megahertz sources for thermal heating of wafers. Induction heating, you can get some which are using the 900 megahertz, especially the cooker in the house. Domestic microwave ovens will use 2.45 gigahertz source. And, the, and for the use of the ISM band, the world is divided into three regions. We have the Americas, that is North America and South America. We have Europe, and we also have Asia. Unfortunately, they assumed that the Africans, of course, will not have any use for these bands, and therefore we have been lumped together with Europe. So the second region is Europe and Africa, third region is Asia, and the first region is, of course, the Americas. So region one, oh, I'm, I'm confusing myself. It's region one is Europe and Africa. Region two is North and South America, or what you call the Americas. And region three is Asia and Australia. Australia usually want to consider themselves Europeans rather than Asians due to for political reasons. But they are actually Asia, so to speak. And that's a, a, a diagram of the regions as they have been arranged. You can see region three there marked in orange, the box of orange, passing through somewhere the Black Sea or something like that, and all the way to the small, small islands. Region two we have shown there as the Americas, which is North and South America, and region one is the rest of the world. Yeah lumped together with the Europeans, Russians, and the likes. So, in region two, I've given bands in region two mainly. So these are the approximate bands that you would get, how they have been defined there. I'll try and get a definition for the region one so that we can have a feeling of where we are. And we can see, like I said, if you look at the two, 2400 to 2500 or 2.4 to 2.5 megahertz or uh, gigahertz, that's where the microwave oven is centered at 2.45, it's right at the center of the band. Bluetooth is around 2.44, uh, whatever your gigahertz, to about 2.48 or something like that. It's within the band itself as well. The two, two, 24 to 24.125 gigahertz, I think that one is a mistake there. It uh, it's, goes a little bit higher. There, it was the first anti-collision radar for, for system for cars was centered at because it makes the antenna small enough to be fitted in a small space. This is where life used to be. They used to use this for that, and but this anti-collision radar has been moved up to the 77 gigahertz and so forth because of the interference. So that brings us to the end of that particular part, and uh, I'm open for any question. Are we happy so far? So I'll assume that uh, you are okay. So I'll just turn, try to introduce you. Yeah, I can have karaoke. Yeah, we are happy. We are okay. So you see this part, this first part is just and LIFI, what is that? Light. There's someone who is asking about LIFI. You are dealing with the light, isn't it? 
Yeah, you are de dealing with a light communication, therefore you are dealing with optical fiber or optical or a radio over optical fiber or radio, you know, kind of communication. And because you are talking about light, remember what you are dealing with, you are, you are in the optical range, so to speak. Okay. Usually you st the main ones, say for example, the TV remote control device uses around, uh, I think uh, nine, nine, uh, 980 nanometer kind of wavelength. So that one is not really light, but you can see there are some which usually use the optical, the visible light to do the communication, such as say, for example, things like laser pointers and the lights. Okay, you have seen those ones. So that cannot be called ISM. Most of the time interference at very high frequencies, not so, uh, so serious, so to speak. But there you find that the higher the frequency, if you are going to radiate into free air, the closer you have to have the relays because the wave attenuates very quickly. And today when we are dealing with, uh, to reduce air or to reduce interference from different base stations, we have Safaricom, we have Airtel, we have everybody else to try and stop interference between cells we are going to higher and higher frequencies so that the coverage, you can reuse your frequencies as quickly as possible. Say for example, if you had one big cell to cover Kenya, then it means you cannot use different frequencies for different uh, you know, communications because they'll all interfere. So what they have done is to uh, split the, the field or the space into small cells and therefore you use different uh, antennas and those ones which are farther apart from each other can reuse the frequencies and therefore the frequencies you've been allocated you can use them to cover your the whole space so to speak so that's all i can say about the light it's because of uh, the new the new ways of dealing in the in the house where you are using led lights and one of the bulbs or one of the diodes will not be producing light that it will be used as a communication channel, so to speak, to try and cover your, field, your room, so to speak. So, I'll now do this. I'll, uh, I'll uh, now start to present this, which is the new one, which is now the real meat of what it is we want to look at. And this is called the electrodynamics and insulation materials A, and now the topic that we shall be looking at is what we call a review of Maxwell's equations. I know it's now 1034, and therefore the only thing I can do is mainly this, uh, introduce this topic so that we can be, yeah. We'll be finishing at 11, isn't it? So I'll just give an introduction of this new topic, then we can take it up from on Wednesday next. So, I'm, I'm sure you have met the Maxwell's equations. And the first one we are interested in is the Faraday's law of induction. And what he said is that if you have a time varying magnetic flux, then you can always measure an electric an electric effect or a voltage around a given circuit so to speak so we consider an open surface depicted there as s so we have a loop of wire okay then we are passing an electric or a magnetic flux of flux density b okay, Weber's per meter square or te te uh, Tesla passing through the, through that S. And therefore, if we were to measure along the, the boundary of that surface S, which we call C, then we'll be able to measure an electric field, which is volts per meter. 
This surface S is assumed to be stationary, and the only differences that is coming from the time differences are only coming from the time variation of the flux density B. That is, B is a function of time. So, what he said is that in statement, he said that the time rate of change of the magnetic flux psi through the open surface S is given by that value there that d psi dt is the same as the integral or the, or the derivative with respect to time of the total flux that is going through that S. We know that B may vary from one position to the other. That is, at the bottom of the surface, it may be different than at the center. So the B is not, we are not saying that it's uniform throughout the surface S. It may be varying in terms of value. So we'll integrate that flux density over that surface and get a, a total flux that is going through the surface S. Then we take the derivative. And this is what we are talking about. B will be the magnetic flux density. Now, the Faraday's law of induction is therefore stated as the negative time rate of change of magnetic flux psi threading or passing through an open surface S that is bounded by a closed curve or a closed curve uh, path C must be equal to the total vol uh, voltage measured around the closed surface. Remember, the volt is measured, is, it's defined as the work done per unit charge. The work done will be the, for the magnetic force or the, ele uh, the electric force per unit charge, which we call the electric field intensity E. Then, if we multiply that one by the charge, we'll get the work done and integrate it over, over the distance that we have there, which is the length of what we call the path length along the curve, will give us a work done on that moving that charge. And therefore, it gives us that in mathematical terms is that the closed integral, line integral, that small circle you see on this, on the integral sign, means it's a close to you, the point, you start from point A and end up at point A, okay? More like a snake biting its, the tip of its tail and we go around it, we go around the circle. So that work done on one side, it gives us the total voltage because E is in volts per meter, you are multiplying it by the distance and therefore we get volts. So this, the left hand side is volts and we are saying according to faraday's it must be equal to the minus of the mega of the time rate of change of the total mag uh, magnetic flux psi okay that negative size means that the voltage increases as the, uh, the, the whatever as the flux decreases so to speak with time So, and therefore, all those words that we used there in English have been reduced to a mathematical statement, which we are more conversant in English. This is called the macroscopic form of the Faraday's law of induction. And it's an important equation that we shall be meeting for every time we talk about electrodynamics. So now we can show how we can reduce this to a point form that we started with. And this is given to us by a mathematical theorem, which says that the line integral of a vector field around a closed curve, it only gives us a measure of the circulation of the curve or the curl of the field in space. Say, for example, if you if you see an, a milliped and you poke it with a piece of grass, it closes itself quickly, it curls up. If you look at a leaf going down a river, you can see it rotating around. 
if you block your sink and then and fill it with water and remove the, the stopper, you will see the water circulate or going around in circles as it's going down the, the sink drain. And for those of us who are keen, the direction of circulation will be different when you are in the northern hem hemisphere, that is in Eldoret, or in the southern hemisphere, as we are in Nairobi, the sink, the circulation of the water in the sink will be in different directions. It won't be the same. Okay? So the can or the circulation, when we take the line integral, that is around that circulation, the rates at which it's circulating, and then we take the line integral, then it will give us a measure of how that circulation is going around. Okay, so the mathematical statements that will allow us how to convert closed line integrals into surface integrals is called the Stokes theorem. I don't know whether you have met the Stokes theorem in mathematics or in electromagnetics that you did in third year, but this is what we are going to state it as. One, Stokes theorem, it states as follows, that the line integral of a vector field around a closed contour C <coughs> will be equal to the integral of the normal component of the curl of that particular vector field over that surface whose boundary is C. That is, as long as we have a surface S and a, or we have a contour C or a path C or a curve C that is closed, and we integrate around it, the vector field around it, then if we took the component of the field, of the curve of that field that is normal to that surface, bounded by C, we'll get the value, the same value, so to speak. So, in other words, the, surface, the line integral, the closed line integral of the electric, uh, electric field intensity, E, is equal to the surface integral of the curl of E, that is del cross E. And we take the normal component because we know that the, the uh, unit vector on a surface is usually the, the normal vector, okay, on that surface is what describes what the surface is, okay? So we'll take the this, ds, that is that dot is the component of the curl of E that is parallel to the ds vector, okay, which is normal on the surface. And we say that that is equal to the minus of the d dt of b dot d ds, as we saw in the Faraday's form. And now we, what we see is that as long as s, both s on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, if they are the same, or they are described by the same contour C, then it means that two integrals can only be equal if the integrands are equal. And therefore, we can drop the surface integral sign and just deal only with the vectors themselves, the arguments themselves, the integrands themselves. And therefore, we can just write it as the curl of E is equal to the minus time rate of change of the magnetic flux density. This is a takeaway that we have to see. That is, we have left from the macroscopic form, that is the averaging, and now we have gone to the particular point in space that you are dealing with. So the curl of E equal to the minus d dB, uh, d, dB dt of, of that value there. This is described as the microscopic, okay? Is the differential or the microscopic form of Faraday's law of induction. And that's the first Maxwell's equation that was formulated. And this, whenever we say that Faraday's law of induction and we use the curl equation, remember we are just dealing with the Maxwell's equation, but we are dealing with Faraday's law of induction. Any question? Questions? Yes. 
So since we don't have any question, then I'll go to the circular uh, circuit or no. Then I think I need only 10 minutes for that. And then we can break at five to, to the hour. So now we can see that we have a time dependence in that uh, Faraday's law. That is D, DDT of B can appear in several ways. That time variation can come in very many way, different ways. And these are what we enumerate in the following. One, we can have that C is a rigid, that we form a circuit using a rigid, a rigid pipe or a rigid road of conductor such that it's very difficult to deform its shape so that the shape is going to be constant. It's going to be the same, doesn't change. Okay. Now, we make that, we make sure that our road, our C is not moving. It's at one position in space and it's hard, that is, it's rigid. It uh, resists deformation. And therefore the surface that it's bounding must be independent of time. It will be the same at all times. And therefore we can reduce Faraday's law of induction into the following form where that the line integral of the, of the electric field is equal to the total derivative of the magnetic flux density okay over that surface and remember s is now constant that's why we are removing the s itself okay the derivative of s with respect to time how s is changing with time now since it's, it's constant then it's not changing with time and we can drop the partial derivatives now we can define a quantity which we shall call vtx and we define it as that line integral of E over the curve. We'll call it the EMF induced in the circuit with C as its boundary. So again, we recognize that the total flux threading the, the surface S is just simply the surface integral of B dot DS, okay? The surface integral of the magnetic flux density will give us psi. And therefore we can re remove the integrals and we have that form that Vtx is equal to the minus of d psi dt. And this is a very familiar shape or a fa familiar form of these particular equations. I'm sure you must have seen it. This therefore, if you can recall the transformers that you dealt with in third year, I think, you had a transformer and you are talking about the voltage of the transformer is equal to the turns ratios of uh, multiplied by the di, dt's of, of the primary and the secondary and so forth. And therefore this equation or Vtx will be called the transformer, we'll call it the transformer EMF. Remember, transformer EMF appears where we have a, a rigid surface or a rigid circuit being threaded by a time varying magnetic flux. Okay, we get the, uh, the transformer EMF. So, the statement of Faraday's induction, electric induction, is given as follows The EMF induced in a stationary closed circuit is equal to the negative time rate of change of the magnetic flux linking the circuit. This is a familiar statement that we have met before in our studies. Okay, there we just used circuits that were not changing and only the flux was changing in time and not in space. So to speak. The negative sign of course comes from Lenz's law which are such that the induced EMF will cause a current to flow in this closed loop 
defined by C in, a di in such a direction, such that any changes in the magnetic flux linking the circuit will be opposed. The, the beginning of what you call inductance is this, is from Lenz's law. You are always trying that the current itself will induce a magnetic field, and the magnetic field that it in the induces will be such that it will try to oppose the change in the magnetic flux, flux that is threading through that circuit. Okay? And that's why we have the negative side. So we give the first, the first example is given there. And what we are saying is that a circular loop of N turns of conducting wire lying in the X, Y plane with its center at the origin of a magnetic field specified by B equal to Z cap B naught cos pi R by 2B, where B is the radius of the loop and omega is the, frequ the angular frequency of the, of the magnetic flux. And we are required to find out what would be the EMFs that would be defined in the loop. The, the diagram is as follows. So the magnetic flux linking each turn of the circuit will be given by psi equal to the integral of that B over S. And we see that it's the integral over the angle and integral over the radius. So it's a double integral to give us a, 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 a whatever, to give us a, a surface. Rd phi, of course, is the arc, arc length and d phi is the angle subtended at the center by that element of, of line on the, on the arc itself. And dr, of course, is the radius from the center going towards b. And in the end, we see that, that when we put in the values of the field itself, what we get is just that multiplied by 2 pi because the angle itself we have seen that our field does not depend on phi, it depends only on omega, and therefore it can, we can just integrate that to 2 pi and multiply everything by 2 pi, and we are just left with r dr. And therefore we can see that psi is going to be given by 8 by pi multiplied by the radius squared into pi by 2 minus 1 of b naught sine omega t. So for n turns, we know that each turn will uh, have a linkage. Therefore, all we need to do is to multiply the linkage. To get the linkage, we just multiply the flux by n, the number of turns. Each one of them is threaded by psi. And we just get that Vtx is just going to be given by the minus of n d psi dt. And we see that is going to be given by that equation there, where we have the omega multiplying the field itself. And therefore, we, when you look at the flux, it's the induced EMF and the magnetic flux. The magnetic flux was a sine wave, but the flux or the induced EMF is a cosine wave. And therefore, they are at 90 degrees from each other, so to speak. So a device that will be using this principle is, of course, the transformer, which you have used before where we have the primary side, where we have the N, N1 n turns, and we have N2 turns, although they are showing like there are three, N1 and N2 are not equal. They could be equal, but we always know that for a step-down transformer, you have N1 larger than N2, and for a step-up transformer, we have N2 larger than N1. And therefore, we have described the currents going into the, into the transformer in those, with those directions and the voltages that would be measured across the terminals. So, for the closed path traced by psi in the magnetic circuit, we can write that N1 multiplied by I1 minus N2 multiplied by I2 is equal to R psi, where R equal to 1 by mu S. Mu S is the permeability of the core, and S is the area, cross-section area of the core and it's called the reluctance of the magnetic, flux, uh, magnetic circuit. And therefore, when we do that, L is of course the length of the core, S is the cross-section of the core, 
And therefore, we can see that N1 minus N2, uh, N1 multiplied by I1 is the current going through the turns minus N2, I2 is equal to L by mu S and multiplied by psi. For an ideal transformer, the permeability is very high, it goes to infinity, and therefore that right-hand side goes to zero, and therefore we can always say that the current I1 divided by the current I2 is the same as the turns ratio, turns ratio that is N2 by N1. And this is something you have seen before. The one you call V1 over V2 equals to N2 over N1 over N2 and so forth in the transformer studies that you have come through. And therefore, we can write that V1 of T is equal to N1 D psi dt and V2 is N2 D psi dt using the, the Faraday's law, okay, with the polarity given so that we get the correct, correct sign of these voltages. And therefore, we can write that V1 by V2 is equal to N1 by N2. The, the resistance in the primary side, which we call the N1 side, we have RP seen by the source, while pushing the current through the windings N1 is given by RP equals to V1 by I1. And when we arrange that, we shall see that that current is the same as using the load or the load resistance on the second coil, set of coils, RL, and multiply by the turns ratio squared. This is something we have already met in uh, transformers as before, as I uh, indicated. But real transformers usually have leakage, okay? That is mu s, by, uh, L by mu s is not going to be equal to zero. And therefore we can say that the flux linkage N1 psi must be equal to the difference of the flux linkages. This, this square should be omitted, it's uh, is there by mistake. Oh yeah, it's okay, we have N1 squared by I1 minus N1, N2 by two, and the flux linkage on the second coin, in terms of the second coin, we have that as follows, as shown there. And therefore, the voltages V1 and V2 can be related, and we have the self-inductance of the first coin, which we'll call L11, uh, with the time rate of change of the current I1, minus the the change in the linkage due to the current I2 and V2 is given as that. Now this looks like something like well, M1 and M, uh, M21 and M12 will be called mutual inductances and we shall see what it is in the following. So L11 will be described as an as a inductance L1. This is because the magnetic core is not, is not the, the transformer is not ideal, therefore it has some leakage. M12 is given by that turns ratio, and the rest are defined as uh, consecutively as shown. So, when the flux linkage is negligible, then we can define a mutual inductance M as the square root of the self inductances L1 and L2. But real transformers will have the liquid not being ne uh, negligible. And therefore the mutual inductance is usually expressed as k root k l1 l2 where k is usually less than unity and is usually called a coupling factor and it accounts for any flux leakage from the circuit before it arrives at the other coils that is all we are saying is that the flux that is linking the two coils is not the same in real transformers it would be different and to account for that we use a factor K or the coupling factor. And therefore the model of the transformer that is real is as shown there. We have XC and RC to represent the leakage within the core. XP, RP is the, is the self impedance that the current I1 would be seeing as it's being pushed by V1. RS, XS is the secondary impedance to the current I2 flowing. And N1 and N2, the one in box is an ideal transformer for which the reluctance is infinite. 
and therefore the linkages are equal. The dot, the black dots have been put there so that we can show the positive side when the current enters the coil. So in the model, those are what have, we have just talked about, the leakage inductive in the inductances, the winding resistances, the losses due to hysteresis and eddy currents in the core, and XC is the magnetization characteristics of the core as well, which, is, which are nonlinear because of the hysteresis itself. And with that, I think we shall now look at the second way in which we can solve or we can introduce the, uh, the time derivative or the time change of the magnetic field, the DDT in Maxwell's equation of B, and this will be looked at on Wednesday. So with that, I want to say that uh, we can, in case you have any question now, you can ask, otherwise we can talk about it on uh, on Wednesday when we meet next. So any question before we move up? So do I assume that we are okay? Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, where can we where can we find the uh, the PDF documents for our own study? The PDF documents I have uh, if you not these particular ones, but the you can always have class notes. You can get class notes in the the e-learning portal. Okay, I'll uh, try to send that when this video is called compiled well you know it takes some um, some time before it compiles maybe i'll send it to you after we have after we log off i'll send it through the class uh, the google class thank okay. you okay so i'll send the, the document to you for in a few minutes after we close any other question Anyone else? So I can safely wish you a nice weekend. Yes. Okay, fine. So just, uh, I, I won't send you the video, but I'll send you the documents, the, and the, whatever the slides, but the main, the main notes, you can get them from the e-learning portal. If you register yourself in that course on the e-learning portal, you can get access to the documents. So with that, then have a nice weekend. Let's meet on Wednesday at 9. We, should, we, we shall continue from there. Okay, so long.